My name is Brian Cross. I'm one of the urologic oncologists here at OU. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Stratton and Dr. Cookson for asking me to participate today. Uh, I wanted to take a short minute to thank our visiting professor for visiting from Indiana from out of town. I know that's a difficult trip. Um, and then also to acknowledge our, our partners from the community who take the time to be here. We know it's a day out of your practice and it's can be tough to be here, so it's nice to have a nice crowd, and so we appreciate everyone taking the time to be here. Um, I, I was asked to talk about, we're going to switch gears here a little bit, and I was asked to talk about the management of high-grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma, which obviously is a disease that we don't see very much because it's not very common, and so there's some kind of some pitfalls about managing this disease. Um, when I tried to decide what to talk about, I didn't think in a room full of surgeons and a room full of urologists that we needed to talk much about nephroureterectomy. I think most people know that, and I would, I would imagine most people in the room can do a competent nephew. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of some newer data that's on the horizon, some controversies in the management, and then we'll talk a little bit about some surgical things at the end. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So as far as the practice gap is concerned and the things that I wanted to address today, one really was sort of we all know about the, um, we all know about the role of perioperative intravesical therapy after TURBT for lower intermediate risk, urothelial carcinoma. What, what's really the role of this after a nephroureterectomy? And is this something we should be doing for our patients before their catheters removed after they've had their kidney taken out for upper tract disease? Um, secondly, we're all well aware of the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There's good level one evidence, good level one data from the Grossman trial from 2003 for neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Is there a role for neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to nephroureterectomy for high grade and or high risk upper tract urothelial carcinoma? That would make sense. It's the same tumor with the same biology, but there's not as robust data. We'll talk about some recent trials that have provided some data kind of what our practice is here. And then this is just something kind of for the surgeons in the room that we'll talk about a little bit in the, at the end, just sort of how you manage the distal ureter. I, I'll die not knowing the right way to do it, I think. And, and I think that this has kind of progressed as the robot has come on board. I would imagine most nephroureterectomies are done minimally invasive, not necessarily robotically now, um, but minimally invasive either laparoscopically or with the robot. With the advent of the XI platform, this has become somewhat more simplified. Um, but managing the distal ureter can be somewhat challenging, I think, at the time of this surgery. Um, and we just talked about those. So this is really a, a rare subset of, of urothelial carcinoma that arises along the upper urothelial tract. And the incidence, really, we don't really know what the incidence is. The incidence is not well defined. These are the numbers from the American Cancer Society. But this is probably overestimated because of this continued and, in my opinion, nonsensical combination of kidney and renal pelvis as one category. We know those are very distinct malignancies, distinct tumors with this distinct biology, but they continue to be grouped. Um, so this is really probably overestimated numbers, 5% in men, 3% in women. Um, so this is an exceedingly rare tumor, and thus we don't really have all that good data about, about how to treat it. Um, this is potentially a more aggressive phenotype than urothelial carcinoma. The bladder up to 50% can, can present with invasive disease. It represents about 5 to 10% of all urothelial cancers, um, and it may really be a distinct disease from lower urinary tract urothelial carcinoma if it arises in the upper tract. And really, how we optimally manage these patients is going to be dependent almost entirely on risk stratification, so low risk versus high risk. Um, and this basically is kind of how we think of this, low risk or solitary low-grade tumors, um, unifocal disease, you know, non-invasive on imaging. I think that Probably, I know I do, and I think maybe most of us still struggle with getting good, adequate upper tract biopsies. They're still difficult to get with the, with the uh, equipment that we have. Even in 2019, we don't really have that good of equipment to get good upper tract biopsies like we, for a proper staging of upper tract disease like we do for, you know, TURBTs that we can do in the bladder. Um, High-risk disease, really any multifocal large tumors, high-grade cytology, uh, on biopsy or on, or on um, cytology, any invasive disease on imaging, or anybody that's had a previous ra radical cystectomy for uh, lower tract disease. Um, we're not going to talk about this much. I think most people know this. Kidney sparing surgery really is standard for low risk disease, whether that's percutaneous or endoscopic um, or segmental ureterectomy with a ureter or ureterostomy or re ureter or re implant. Nephew. With bladder cuff excision, really remains the standard for high risk disease. Although certainly there are uh, special circumstances where kidney sparing surgery can be considered in people with high risk disease. Obviously, people with, people with solitary kidneys or renal function, where removal of a renal unit might 
uh, submit them to dialysis. But really, NEPU for and a bladder cuff excision is really still the standard for high risk disease. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about intravesical therapy after NEPU. Really, the the rationale for intravesical therapy is decrease recurrence rates in the bladder. We know recurrence rates in the bladder after with people with upper tract disease can be as high as 40%. Obviously, with lower tract, the upper tract recurrence rate is much less than that. So these people have a very high rate of recurrence in their bladder, and their bladder has to be surveyed. So the rationale is, can we decrease these recurrence rates in the bladder, and how do we do that? Uh, this was a, this, there's really only two randomized trials about this, and both of them are several years old. Uh, this was a British study published in EU in 2011. Um, it was 46 centers from 2000 to 2006. They had 284 patients that were undergoing surgery for upper tract disease, and they got a single postoperative dose of mitomycin C, 40 milligrams and 40 mLs of um, saline, or standard management at the time they removed their catheter. And then they surveyed their bladder at 3, 6, and 12 months. So this is their uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, and the blue curve, if you can't see in the back, the blue curve is the mitomycin um, group, and the orange curve is the no mitomycin group. And this, just, this is really the only thing that I wanted to point out here. Recurrence rates in the mitomycin group, 17, and the no mitomycin group, 31. So their relative risk reduction with this treatment at the time of catheter removal was 40%, and their number needed to treat to prevent one bladder tumor was 9. So this was some pretty decent data that this was, this was potentially helpful. This was the second um, randomized trial. This was from Japan. Uh, they used pirarubicin. Um, which is kind of similar, uh, but this is the, they didn't use mitomycin. Uh, this was 77 patients from 11 institutions between 2005 and 2008, so it was a bit of a smaller study, um, and they randomly assigned people to receive inter intravesical treatment within 48 hours. So in the other study, it was a time of catheter removal, which can be different for everybody. Some people wait a week to remove the catheter. Some people wait two weeks. Some people take it out before they leave the hospital, um, and we'll talk about that in a second, too, so the variation of timing of when people get this. But this one were, was, a, was um, assigned to receive it within two days after their surgery. And they showed very similar results. The, the blue curve is the treatment curve. The yellow curve is the control curve. Median follow-up was 25 months uh, in the treatment group and 14 months in the control group. And their recurrence rates were very similar, 17% at one year and two years in the treatment group versus about 40% in the control group. So these are really the only two randomized studies that I could find in the literature that supported this. And both of them, again, are, this, this was a JCO paper from five years or six years ago now. This was uh, a little bit more recent in 2017. This was basically a survey of American urologic oncologists about whether they do this, if they do it, how they do it, and if they don't do it, why don't they do it? Um, and this was uh, done from the uh, Steve Borgen is at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and uh, Raman is from Hershey, Pennsylvania. So this was basically a survey that they sent out to 158 urologic oncologists. 49%, so less than half, utilized or postoperative intravesical therapy. And this was basically the reason why. Over half, or 44% plus 19%, basically just didn't believe it. So 44% was a lack of data, 19% was urologist preference, and then the others were sort of a smattering of, you know, extravasation concern versus, you know, over-treatment concern, patient didn't want it, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the take-home from this was most people are not doing it, and most people are not doing it because the data that they see is not something that they think are um, convincing enough to make them do it, I think. It, can just as a kind of show of hands, who does this before they take the catheter out after nephew? Yeah, so a minority, but some. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about just a little bit uh, before is there's wide variation about when this is done. Very wide variation. We know for TURBT, you try to do it immediately post-op or certainly within the first 24 hours. This, some people were doing it over two weeks out. So there's a wide variation of when people are doing this. So there's no standard treatment or no standard schedule about when people are getting treatment in their bladder. Like I said, everybody takes the catheter out a little bit differently. So there's certainly no standardized um, schedule about when this happens.
Uh, we're going to move on just uh, here to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. As I said before, there's clear level one evidence from 2003 from the Grossman trial in the New England Journal that neoadjuvant chemo prior to radical cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer has a survival benefit. We know that, and I think most people have bought into that, that we're doing neoadjuvant chemo in people that can tolerate platinum-based chemo. Um, Many patients after nephew, the rationale for giving it before nephew is that many people after a nephew are going to be ineligible to get platinum. Their, re their renal function is not going to tolerate it. So can we stratify people such that they can get it while they have their kidney in place before we take their kidney out? Um, it, it, the, the rationale for it is very similar to the rationale for bladder cancer. As muscle invasive bladder cancer has a risk of micrometastases. High risk upper tract urothelial has the same risk of micrometastases. And this, this systemic therapy prior to surgery will treat those micromets, and then obviously the surgery will, will gain local control. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. There's some concern. Um, amongst, I think, the medical oncology community that we're over-treating these people with chemotherapy because we can't really stage people upper tract like we can lower tract. It's very hard to get a quote-unquote muscle invasive diagnosis as an upper tract with the current biopsy techniques. Um, this was a systematic review from 2014 published in EU, and basically they looked at all the neoadjuvant chemo studies. Um, they also looked at adjuvant too, but we're not really, I'm not going to discuss that. Um, and this is basically what they were, five studies. And this is basically the ones that they looked at. And you can see they were all retrospective, two multicenter, but most of them single center studies with relatively low number of patients that got neoadjuvant chemo. So 47, 31, I think 47 was the most. That was the Margulis trial. So there was a paucity of data when they looked at this about people getting neoadjuvant chemo prior to surgery. Um, this was their forest plot, though. Basically, they didn't, I, I didn't include all the studies. This was basically overall their forest plot, their hazard ratio for disease-specific survival after neoadjuvant chemo favored neoadjuvant chemo. So 0.4 was their hazard ratio. So, so seemingly, with not very high-level evidence, this was something that was potentially helpful. Um, this, this was the paper from Serena Mateen from, um, from MD Anderson, which is this one the 2010 retrospective single center study. Uh, and basically, they looked at 43 patients, high-grade upper tract urothelial, neoadjuvant chemo followed by nephew, and then they looked at, they kind of got a control group of 107 patients that they had done before that didn't have um, neoadjuvant chemo. And they looked at their incidence of pathologic downstaging in people that had gotten chemo. Um, this was their representative image. This was a 78-year-old guy. He had a biopsy-proven retrocaval lymph node and a high-grade upper tract urothelial in his right kidney. This goes against, I think, the um, rationale, or it goes against the um, thought of neoadjuvant treatment, because really they should be clinically node negative. This guy was node positive, but in any event, um, he had a pathologic, basically a radiographic complete response. So this node went away. There was nothing in his kidney. He went ahead to nephew and the lymph node dissection, T0, with negative nodes. So this was sort of their success, or one of their success stories. Um, most of these people got MVAC. Uh, we'll talk about that a, a little bit in the, in the next slide. Um, and then they looked at basically complete response, partial response, or stable disease. So many people either had a complete response or a partial response, and then they looked at tumor size decrease. So it, it, it seems that this helps. The, the, the challenge is who do we give it to and who do we not give it to? Um, this, was, this is basically going to be, I think, the, one of the higher level evidence that we have. This is an ECOG 8141 study that we had open here at Stevenson. It's closed now. Um, but this was basically a phase two trial neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to nephew um, for people with, with high grade upper tract urothelia. So they had a high grade non metastatic upper tract disease, decent kidney function, decent heart function, and no grade two or higher neuropathy. People whose kidney function could tolerate platinum, um, they got accelerated MVAC for four cycles. People whose kidney function wasn't so good got Jim Carbo, and the accrual goal was 30 patients in each arm. Um, and then everybody underwent nephew with a lymph node dissection. It wasn't really quote-unquote lymph node dissection. It wasn't really defined about what a lymph node dissection was versus was it, what it wasn't, but that was kind of left to the discretion of the surgeon. And then the primary endpoint was pathologic complete response. Um, I, I could be m mistaken. I don't think this is in print yet, but it's been reported as sort of late-breaking abstracts at the AUA. I think it was in 2018 at the, at the um, 
at, the, uh, at San Francisco. But basically, the pathologic complete response rate was 14% in the MVAC arm, um, and 62% were less than or equal to T1. MVAC was relatively safe and well tolerated. The Jim Carbo arm was closed early due to poor accrual, and the reason for that probably was a lack of um, enthusiasm among referring providers and a very narrow creatinine clearance window. So not a lot of people were eligible for that arm. So that was closed early. There's a follow-up ECOG trial of neoadjuvant chemo plus a pdl one blocker, um, which could potentially allow patients that are platinum ineligible to be randomized. So that's, I, th I think, in the works. So there's, there are, I think there are emerging evidence that this is going to be beneficial in patients with uh, high-risk upper tract disease, large multifocal tumors, invasive on imaging, high grade on biopsy, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge for us is going to be to know who to give it to and who not to give it to. And I don't really know that we are great at deciding that just yet. Um, this is the last thing I want to talk about, but I think it's kind of interesting to talk about because I think that this is something that we could sort of banter about over beers about how you do this and, you know, what the right way to do it is. But everybody knows about the nephrectomy and the ureteral excision. I think the bladder cuff is really the, the way that is really the area that is there's a lot of variability among surgeons. When I was in residency, we did all these laparoscopically, and we did a TUR of the, of the UO. Many people, I'm sure, have done that. We would put a catheter in the UO, use a Collins knife, and TUR the, the intramural ureter out into the retroperitoneal fat. And then you go do the ureter, and as you come down to get the ureter, you just kind of pluck it out. My guess is that many people that are doing these robotically now are using the XI platform, and they can basically take a bladder cuff extra vesicle and sew it up. So that's also a reasonable way to do it. People with really bulky distal tumors or tumors that are invading into the bladder through the UO, I think some people are still doing a low midline incision, opening the bladder and coring the UO out um, open. So I think all those are reasonable. Um, there's really, obviously there's oncologic importance of a, of, of a bladder cuff and excision. How you do it is not, there's not a lot of data about how to do that. I will say, and I'm sure everybody here has been in this situation, going back to dig out a stump recurrence is really painful. It's really painful to get it out. So whatever you do, try not to leave a little piece of ureter in the extra vesicle um, fat, because going back to get a stump recurrence out is really difficult. Because um, those, those recurrence rates can be 30 to 65%. There's really no level one evidence that supports one strategy over the other. This is kind of what you prefer to do, what your comfort level is. But really, you should uh, obviously adhere to the key surgical principles of oncologic surgery. Um, this is an older study, but it was the biggest one I could find, 820 people. This, this was done over a 20-year study in 10 centers in Canada. So this was probably a little bit before the robotic platform, especially the XI platform, had really taken hold. Um, so they did 50% of these intravesical, 38% extravesical, and 12% endoscopic. And, and basically, the recurrence-free survival rates were much better for intravesical, probably because they got a better bladder cuff than they could do extravesical or endoscopic. Like I said, the, the, the robot now has probably obviated some of this, um, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, bulky distal tumors, as I said, you know, if you think you can get a better bladder cuff by making a little a low midline incision, clamshelling the bladder, coring it out and closing it, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I, I, I do that. Um, the robotic platform is utilized more and more in the U.S. You could argue that that's, that if these can be done laparoscopically. The, the robot adds cost. We could argue that too. Today's not the day to argue that. Uh, but the extra vesicle approach risks leaving that ureter behind. And if they recur in that ureter, then you, you have a really difficult case on your hands. Um, so just in conclusion, I think the guidelines, that they wouldn't allow me to put the NCCN guidelines in here. Apparently, it's a copyright violation. I saw Parker had one in his. He must have got away with it somehow. But they, they, they told me I couldn't do it. But it's actually in the NCCN guidelines now about a postoperative intravesical uh, dose of... Um, of uh, uh, postoperative intravesical therapy after radical nephew. So that is something that's supported by the guidelines. There's really growing evidence to support neoadjuvant chemo, and I think as this ECOG trial sort of reports more of its data, that that will be more helpful. And then really there's no consensus about this, but this is just something that I think the surgeon has to decide for him or herself um, and sort of do what they're comfortable with.